Well, uh, welcome this evening, and uh, thank you for coming. I think this is the last of some 20, 25 lectures at the University College this academic year. We can call it the Faculty of Castle. And uh, 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 it's last a case of last, but definitely not uh, least, Tom. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Tom Brooks from the uh, Reader in, in Law uh, here at Durham. For my conversations with Tom uh, this morning, which I just by coincidence had an, an hour with him this morning, I know he's not just a pioneering academic, but as far as I'm concerned, very much of a kindred spirit. Mm -hmm. So uh, today is a great marker for me, Tom, since I will look forward to many, many conversations with you. Um, Tom has published a great deal, but I just want to mention a, a book published uh, two weeks ago and launched at the House of Lords, was it? Uh, two was weeks ago. Sorry. With the rather stark but clear title, uh, Punishment. And uh, I, I want to just mention one other very substantial volume co-edited with Martha Nussbaum called um, Hegel's Political Philosophy, no less. Quite a demanding set of texts to take on. Tom's work spans a number of areas, uh, from criminal law to jurisprudence, from political philosophy to public policy, therefore absolutely ideal interlocutor for me. <laughs> and his talk is as titled here, which I don't need to read to you, but just to uh, say many thanks for coming. Uh, 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 our students have all finished, as you know, so uh, students are hard to find these days in lectures, but I'm sure that uh, if there are a few missing today, we'll make it up with a volume of very acute questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to uh, come out tonight uh, for this talk, a labor of love, both personal and uh, professional, as I will explain. Each of you, I hope, has a copy of my new report minted this afternoon on the Life in the UK uh, uh, test. Um, something it wasn't commissioned, it was all independently written, drafted, conceived, and so on by uh, my, myself. In part because there is no comprehensive review of this important test that is a central part of immigration uh, policy today that's available. Um, and I wanted, in some sense, wanted to fill this important gap uh, and create a kind of a first comprehensive uh, 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 investigation, examination of the test. Uh, that can hopefully be a benchmark for some work that happens in future. There also hasn't been a whole lot of consultation, certainly not much public consultation, on the Life in the UK test since it's, uh, la the launch of the handbook in uh, 2004. And in some sense, I think that has helped contribute to a lot of the problems that I think the test has had. It hasn't been seen through the eyes of people who have been an immigrant firsthand and have had to take things like this uh, test. If they had been, then I suspect many problems might have been uh, avoided. This research is informed by personal experience. So as the master has noted, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Held, for the introduction. Um, I'm in a law school, um, but my background is multidisciplinary and I think good ways. I started off in music, uh, turning to political science. I have also two degrees in philosophy. Worked in a politics department for eight years before moving uh, to a law school. And this kind of unique background in politics, philosophy, and, and more recently in law, I think also uh, and on one hand makes the topic of a citizenship test interesting to me as an object of study, as, uh, you know, given my uh, background. Uh, but also immigration is something that I've done. So I'm originally from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and I left the United States for uh, Ireland in 1999, moved from Ireland to the UK t in 2001. So I been in the UK for a little while now. Um, I sat in past life in the UK test, so as I say, this is personal experience. I did sit it, I did pass it, of course. It wouldn't be a good talk if I didn't make it through uh, in 2009. Um, and I achieved uh, British citizenship um, in uh, 2011. And one of the things that this experience helped do for me, given my background and having sat the test, I quickly saw that there were a lot of problems and I thought I was very well placed to try to correct this. I did publish an earlier paper about problems with the second edition. I don't know how closely it was read um, by the drafters of the new edition. And so here we are uh, tonight uh, with this uh, uh, edition, this new test. I reveal in the report serious problems uh, with the uh, third edition of the test. 
uh, which was recently published this year. Problems like that it is impractical, that it's inconsistent in many areas. And it's already in some respects outdated, which is curious because it's only been out a couple of months. There's a serious gender imbalance that I will highlight. And I think the test in moving from the second um, uh, edition to uh, the current third edition has moved from being a test that about practical trivia to the purely trivial. Um, and I will be giving you, you'll all be expecting some questions uh, uh, to consider uh, that arise uh, related to the test. And I won't disappoint you. I'll be giving you um, some questions tonight to see how well we all do. There's also some concerns I try to raise with um, the English uh, proficiency requirement that's also part of the test. Um, I often trumpeted it as a real sell of trying to strengthen um, the English, or tighten the requirement for English language. I'm going to cast some doubt that that's true. And I end with 12 recommendations for improving the test. So the object here is not about, there's some problems with the test and so we shouldn't have any. Uh, the thought instead is that this test could be done a lot better than it is. And that's what I want to try to uh, promote uh, tonight. So, an in introduction to this test. The Life in the UK test is a requirement for all applicants for permanent settlement and or citizenship. Uh, when I passed the test in 2009, a lot of my friends said, wow, Tom, congratulations on being a British citizen. And my reply was, how little do you know about being a British citizen? That passing the test didn't make you a citizen. It didn't even make you close to being one. It was a requirement to be a permanent resident, which you must satisfy that requirement before you can, um, off, uh, um, in general, apply uh, for uh, citizenship. Over one million tests have been sat since the first test launched in 2005. So this is not something that only a handful of people have done. It's something that a lot of people have done. And about 150,000 people sat the test in 2012 last year. Um, and as I say, the test is an integral part of immigration policy. I note that this test is a, is a requirement for permanent residency and or citizenship. It's not the only requirement. You instead can take this course called the English for Speakers of Other Languages uh, course. And I just want to say a quick word about what that is. Uh, that is a uh, test, uh, a course, uh, usually about two months or more. Uh, much, so it's much longer uh, duration. It's much more expensive as well. Um, uh, where, they, where you're taught English language, um, you know, some basics of English, along with uh, uh, some information about uh, things that you'd find in the Life in the UK uh, test. So the attraction for a lot of people in the Life in the UK test is if you can either take this course over a couple of months or instead you can sit this one-off test that's cheaper and quicker and so on, then many have opted um, for the test. So an integral part, and I say integral part because one, it's been around about 10 years, introduced by labor uh, a lab labor government. But of course, the new edition is, uh, has come out uh, under the coalition government. So this is not something that it's only, uh, only one party supports this, or it's a view of one particular uh, view. Um, it's, it's one that uh, <coughs> seems to be shared um, by several. So what's this test about? The test has 24 multiple choice questions. That's the good news. There is multiple uh, choice. You, do, you are able to guess, I suppose. You have 45 minutes to answer these questions. Uh, these days, it's online registration um, and at 60 different test centers. Um, I sat mine across the street from the Newcastle General Hospital, where I'd probably have to be admitted if I had failed the test. Um, and my frustration myself if that had happened. Um, but you know, don't worry, everyone. I was fine. Um, applicants must answer 18 or more of these 24 questions correctly to pass. So you need to get a first. You need to get above 70%. Um, uh, to pass. It can be taken no more than once uh, per every seven days, <laughs> right? Um, very important. Um, uh, but it does not mean it can be taken every week. Why? Well, um, the fact that you can take it in theory once every seven days doesn't mean in practice that you are able to do it. Uh, when I first phoned a number to register myself to take the test, I had to wait about a month uh, before there was a time in Newcastle uh, where I could uh, uh, take it. So um, in, pra in reality, it might often be for many people um, a bit more than um, once every uh, seven days. The general pass rate is reported um, in the report things I've seen, official documents I've seen, to be about 70%. Some say even as high as 75%. Um, 
which is, which is, I think, a surprising figure, not because the test is so hard, it must be much lower, or that I think the number you know, is uh, so different. It's just that my, in my experience, when I set the test, most of the room had failed. I know this because I saw the letters and, and the talk of, now you have to register, call this number to set the test again. I know most of the room failed. And almost everyone I know without exception who took the test, um, there's a couple exceptions, almost everyone said that most in the room had failed. Um, this test as well. But the official pass rate is about 70% or so. There is wide variation by countries of origin, as I highlight. Australia and the United States I highlight um, because in Australia and the United States, there is a citizenship test. So there's already a culture and a history of taking these tests for citizenship. And maybe that's something to explain um, um, why they do so well. 98% pass. Bangladesh and Turkey, um, in the last report that I saw, were the countries that where they fared the worst. So the lowest percentages of, of a group of people was about 45%. It is true that people from places like Easter Island set the test and the one person zero. There are some zero percents, but that was countries where only one or none uh, 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 sat it. For countries where a substantial number sat it, Bangladesh and Turkey is the um, lowest. The test costs 50 pounds uh, per sitting. So how much does the thing cost? Um, that's how much it costs now. It's up from the 32 pounds 24 pence that was 30 pounds plus VAT, um, when I took it um, in 2009. And of course, in the good old days, uh, you had to pay an exact change. So that was 32, 24 pounds. I had to go to a, uh, off or not, uh, a convenience store to uh, get some change because I didn't have enough pennies uh, in my uh, one pence coins to uh, pay the fee. Um, the test has a handbook and supplementary texts, which I will show you. I have brought them. I think most people haven't seen what these books look like that, are, that people are studying, and so I thought um, I'd do a little show and tell. The cost of the test and the, uh, the uh, supplementary texts have risen about 60% over the last um, year or so. So it's gone from 48, pence 20, uh, 48 pounds 22 pence in 2009 to 78, pence, uh, 90, uh, 78 pounds 97 pence if you take it once. If you have to take it a second time uh, or a third time, I have those numbers. These numbers are not inclusive of the application fees. right? So you take this, you can be a permanent resident. Um, to apply in person at one of the many fine centers for permanent residency, the fee was something like, uh, when I did it, about 1,100 pounds. It's now 1,920 pounds um, to do it in person. So, the, so this is in, not inclusive of the um, other fees. If what people are thinking the numbers seem a bit low, um, they, there are other costs uh, that you can incur as well. So here's the show and tell part. The test material costs. At first, there was one. There was one book. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the first edition handbook. And there was just the handbook. Um, a couple of chapters written by Sir Bernard Crick, um, uh, and so on. So first we had one book, costing $9.99, 146 pages available at a local bookstore near you once upon a time. Second edition, we then, then there were two. Um, we see a new edition of the handbook. So it, as you can see very clearly, it looks very similar uh, to in, in, in shape and so on. Uh, there are a, a variety of changes. I'll say something about the, what's inside. Um, but you see, they, step, uh, they kept with the same uh, general look. But the second edition gave us something else. It gave us practice questions and answers in an official uh, uh, study uh, guide that you could also uh, purchase. So we see first edition, one book. Second edition, two books. Third edition, how many books? Three, of course. So we see a guide for new residents. We see a new uh, handbook uh, here. The cost has gone up from the $9.99 to $12.99. So uh, a slight increase. The official study guide has been replaced by an official practice questions and answers book, which has a lot more questions uh, inside. This, the cost of this has also gone up by a couple of pounds, so we have that book. Note, note we've got white, blue, and red. So we've got the red, white, and blue uh, colors of the flag, very attractive, welcoming uh, more immigrants uh, uh, to this country. And the, there's then a new official study guide, in case you haven't had enough books about citizenship, you can also get uh, this as well. What is this? It is a summary of the, early, of the previous two uh, uh, books. It's a bit of the handbook, and it's a bit of the uh, practiced uh, question books. Um, will there be a fourth book in the fourth edition? I think it's perhaps too early to tell, but the track record uh, is looking likely at the moment. A quick note about the background. There, um, 
probably the, the uh, genesis of the censorship test. And I mean, it's hard to choose the exact point to begin. But one point might be what's been called the Denim Report of 2001, where in that report there was a finding that it is essential to establish a greater sense of citizenship based on common principles that are shared by all sections of the community. This thought that Britain was coming very, uh, there's a large immigrant population, and this thought of having some kind of cohesive narrative thread or story or something that could bring us together in some way. Um, this finding in the report um, was endorsed also by this um, uh, second group called the Life in the UK Advisory Group, set up by David Blunkett in 2002 and chaired by his former tutor at the University of Sheffield when Blunkett was a student, uh, Sir Bernard uh, Crick. They wrote a report, The New and the Old, the report of the Life in the UK Advisory Group in 2003. And it's that group that authored this. So this, this group that Blunkett set up, they um, wrote the first edition of this test. And the recommendations they had for the kinds of things they think should be in it are the things we find in it. So a chap, you know, with chapters include uh, uh, elements of history, some basic points of law, um, but also things about everyday life they thought was very important for immigrants to have uh, some awareness of and also employment um, issues. The first edition uh, that was produced, published in 2004, the test of 2005. This is a very non-partisan uh, talk, critical of all uh, three uh, editions. I think it's, it's maybe charitable to say the first edition is poorly written. Um, and it was uh, criticized shortly after publication. The London Review of Books said, the funniest book currently available in the English language. I will give you examples as to why? Um, part of the problem with this book was um, uh, that it was rushed, and a couple of chapters were written by one person, Sir Bernard Crick, and indeed his chapter that he authored himself on history was the most criticized of the uh, uh, chapters in the book. So we have this quote, I, I, I note Crick instead of Churchill because it's really Crick's words and Churchill. Crick claims Churchill said, must be from memory, never in the course of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few, which perhaps at first uh, reading, you know, well, that sounds okay. But in fact, Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to uh, so few. So that was one of the first things picked up. Why? Because it's on like the first or second page. It's very early in the, in the chapter you come across this. Plus, Charles II is described as being in exile, coming back from his exile in France. Uh, he wasn't in exile in France. It was another error. In fact, in fa in, instead, he was in um, the great country of the Netherlands. We have a representative uh, from that great country here uh, tonight. There are other errors. Uh, uh, the uh, first edition claims that Great Britain consists of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It doesn't. It doesn't include Northern Ireland. Um, uh, another error, and this is persistent in uh, the editions, a problem of just how many MPs are in Parliament, right? So the first edition claims there were 645. There weren't. 645 people contested the general election of 2005 because one of the candidates in Staffordshire South died. So that, elec that election for that seat didn't happen that day, but it happened shortly afterwards. There were 646 MPs, um, but Crick got that number wrong. And you're going to see this problem come back. When asked by the Guardian what went wrong, like what was the problems here, Bernard Crick was unusually frank. Well, not for him, but for people who work on documents like this. So there are errors in it because it was done fairly quickly. And the argument was a lot of people applying for uh, citizenship were on hold. Their applications were uh, kept on hold because the thought was they ought to be passing this test. And so the thought was there was this backlog, and he had to move fast. Um, uh, because of these cases building up. So there's some serious problems with the first edition, very badly written, badly presented, I think, and also a lot of factual errors inside. Um, and this point about the mistaken number of MPs is one that no commentator has previously found about the first edition. No one has caught that uh, error before. So there's even innovations going back on the first edition uh, tonight. The second edition uh, was published in 2007. So less than a full three years after the first edition, we then already have a second edition of the test. And this is the bit more slick-ish looking of the, of the handbook um, uh, here. Ooh, and I've gone out. Here we are. This version is 
it's revised, so the errors of facts that we find in the first edition have been thankfully corrected. It's been polished, so a lot of the statements about what happened when and where and by who have been redrafted to make a lot more sense uh, than the first edition. It, the, the language is cleared up uh, much more, and it is more readable. It also contains in the conclusion a glossary with over 400 uh, terms in the back. Um, I believe I counted them. There's about 413 uh, terms in the back of the book. And these are terms like, you know, houses of parliament. These are words that appear in the book to help immigrants new to this country um, understand a bit more some uh, definitions about basic element parts of UK life. There were a lot of problems uh, with this second edition. One is that it quickly became outdated. And it got to the point when sitting the test that correct answers were often factually untrue. I'm going to give you examples tonight. Another problem with the second edition is that I think, well, I think it's a problem, that not all chapters in the handbook were tested. That's also the case in the first edition. So now both have chapters on history. So claims that the new, test, the new test handbook is the first to include history. It's not. The test is the first to test British history. But British history has always been in the citizenship uh, uh, test um, handbooks. But elements about British history and basic parts of law were not tested on the first two editions of the test. This is stuff like, um, uh, how do you contact the police? Um, and uh, what should you do if you are arrested? Some basic points of law uh, like this. You need, you know, you need not uh, become a barrister or a law professor uh, to get your, uh, to, to learn these facts. And in a BBC Radio 4 interview, I uh, watch for what you wish for, ladies and gentlemen. I called for uh, revision and inclusion uh, of these chapters, and, and sometimes I did get that. I got much more of uh, British history, as I'll explain, um, uh, than I wanted. Um, and so let me give you some sample questions that appear in the second edition of the test. So not all the questions are terrible. Some of it, you might think, anyone who uh, lives in this country ought to know some things like this. So one uh, 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 question that you can find is which of the following statements is correct? The Geordie dialect is spoken in Ty, uh, uh, Tyneside. The Geordie dialect is spoken in Liverpool. You better get that right in this part of the world. Um, so obviously, the correct answer is A. So some of the answers, some of the questions are straightforward. And how is this? A gap year describes the summer school holidays, the year that students spend working in industry, uh, a year between school and university which students spend traveling or working. Of course, the correct answer the year after GCSE. So these are kind of basic parts often for many people in British life that you might think immigrants should know something about. I'll give you another. The government department responsible for collecting taxes. So immigrants might want to challenge or query the taxes uh, they're being charged. Uh, so here, of course, the correct answer is C. But again, another uh, question um, that is uh, this one you might think is uh, one of the kinds of things you should should be on a test. It's practical. It's a kind of thing that immigrants uh, should know. And I'll give you one uh, possible trick question uh, before going into the problems. This is GCSE stand for Graduate Certificate of Secondary Education. No. <laughs> General Certificate of Special Education. No. D. I move, I'm going to skip what grade certificate of school education. No, it's C. General Certificate of Secondary uh, Education. That was one I found. Um, when, I had stu when I was preparing for this test, students um, would come to me in office hours with their questions, and I'd say, before you ask me your question, let me ask you mine. And I would give questions like this to them. This is one that often tripped a lot of people up. But these are some sample questions to show the kinds of things I think we might think should be on this test. And then we've got these questions. In 2001, the population of the UK was nearly which? So who here, let's have some fun, who thinks it's 56 million? Nope, that's okay. 58 million? Nope, 60 million? Of course, you're right, uh, and then there's 62 million. Why this is a trick question? Because the population of the UK is 62 million today. Exactly, it's 62 million today, and it was 62 million in 2009 when I sat this question on my test, so actually, um, the population of the UK was not 60 million, the correct answer. The, uh, but, of course, strictly speaking, it's asking you about eight years earlier when I took it in 2009. And eight years earlier on the previous census, it was 60 million, just under 60 million. So, um, so that's trick question number one. But I want to have a lot more fun with my audience tonight.
<laughs> How many parliamentary constituencies are there uh, in the UK? Now, this, of course, is a question um, that I said would come back to haunt us in the second edition. Now, I've already said the answer to this, so I'll spare anyone in the room embarrassment. Of course, the answer is C. 646, and just about no one knew anyone who got this one right of my students, um, who, I have to say, were all politics students at another university. Um, were, those who got it right were just guessing it. But what's great about this question was, yes, in March 2007, when this went to press, there were 646 constituencies. There were 646 MPs, then changed to 650. So everyone sitting the test, the how many constituencies are there? Well, there are 650. <laughs> But the correct answer to pass the test was 646. I'm not uh, through with you uh, people yet. And because I asked you that question, I have to ask you this. How many seats does the UK hold in the European Parliament? This is a trick question, my dear friends, because the correct answer isn't there. The correct answer is actually 72. It was changed after March 2007. And this was the case for those sitting the second edition. These are second edition questions. This is true for the second edition when it was out, not in its last month, not in its last year, about three years before it was uh, changed. So the correct answer for the test is 78. It is C. So, uh, so I, I did promise I'd be informative um, and entertaining, and I'm trying to see if I can live up to the bill. I've got two more I want to give you from the second edition before I move on. Young people from families with low income can get financial help with their studies when they leave school at 16. This help is called, do spare anyone embarrassment? Of course, the correct answer is C, the education maintenance allowance. The problem with that, of course, is that it was scrapped, um, right? So you had to learn about programs you could apply for if you were on low income, which you might not have in order to um, uh, uh, immigrate in the first place. So you had to know about these programs you probably wouldn't ever have to, have to do about benefits and other kinds of things um, that had been canceled, that had been closed. But I do have my favorite question. We all have our favorite question from the second edition. This one is mine. Which two places can you go to if you need a national insurance number? <laughs> Who thinks one of those answers is the Department for Education and Skills? Do I have any takers? Okay, I've got a very uh, a good audience tonight, very uh, uh, astute. Who thinks it's the Home Office? We got one or two, three, as in, that's, that's okay, good, no, that's all right. Who thinks it's Job Center Plus? Who thinks it's Social Security Office? Okay. Now, of course, anyone sitting in this test in 2009 would discover the following. Of course, the Department for Education and Skills did not exist at that time, and the Social Security Office also didn't exist. You had two departments on this uh, that didn't exist anymore that you were asked about. Okay, that's part one. The correct answer, ladies and gentlemen, is C and D. It is Job Center Plus and the Social Security Office. But there's, there's two hitches. One, of course, Social Security Office was closed and part of the Department for Work and Pensions at the time. The second hitch is this. When I got my national insurance number in the great city of Sheffield, um, I phoned the Home Office, who arranged an interview um, uh, for me with the Department of Work and Pensions, not the Social Security Office. So I didn't go to Job Center Plus or Social Security Office to have the national insurance number that I brought with me uh, to, as part of my proof of who I was and, and uh, that I was uh, able to take this test. Um, yeah, one of my favorite, qu my favorite question on the second edition. So there's a series of problems then um, with that second edition test that it asked you to put the correct answer um, for things that were factually untrue. A lot of information was outdate. And notice a lot of the stuff about where do you go to get this number or that number or that, you'd probably just go to Google uh, and look this up. So it was very, it was, very, it was, it was trivia, it was practical uh, trivia. It was tri trivia about bureaucratic programs, the kind of thing you might expect civil servants to draft up if we were to be unkind. Um, you know, kind of, you know, uh, testing uh, uh, the public about their knowledge about different programs. New test launch. Confer there were confirmed plans for a new test in October 2011. Um, the new test was to appear in autumn uh, 2012. That was confirmed as late as September, but not published until the 28th of January. And this is the happy book. And the test was claimed by um, uh, our, uh, the, the coalition government to put British history and culture at its heart. The new handbook 
has some problems with its launch. One of those is the new handbook does not state when it is the official book for the new test. So how is this a problem? Well, second edition says official publication valid for tests from April 2007. You know when this is valid. But this was available for new applicants to get their hands on studying for the test at the same time as this book was available for applicants to take the test. They are very different inside, and the tests are entirely different. This book does not say when it is valid. It just says it is the official guide. It doesn't say from when. Um, and the from when is 20, was 25th of March. Um, yeah, so it's only about for tests afterwards. The, there are different editions with very different contents, but available at the same time. I think that was something overlooked with the launch uh, of the uh, new uh, test. There were also supplemental texts unavailable until after the new test was launched. And these task, uh, texts was this kind of curious hybrid of the handbook and the question book, the official study guide. Not to be confused with the second edition official study guide, because they are entirely different uh, in form and content. Um, and also the, the practice questions. So we have a new, uh, a new test uh, being uh, uh, produced. Um, we have the handbook, but we didn't have the supplemental texts. The problem with that was, it was in the supplemental texts that we saw how many correct answers are required to pass the test. If you look in the handbook, it doesn't tell you. So those who got the book for the test could not have known what they had to get if, the t if there had been a change. It wasn't in the book. The types of questions on the test, there are multiple choice that take several different forms. People had to, of course, assume, and of course, if they did assume, it would be right. The form of the questions was the same as before. The number you had to get right, 18 out of 24, was also correct. But you couldn't know this in the new uh, handbooks, uh, in the new handbook. And also the question distribution by chapter. Um, not all chapters need to be read to pass this test comfortably. I went through um, and through each of these chapters to find how many questions in the official practice book, how many questions for each chapter appear in the sample test that they offer. And I know this is hard to read, but a copy uh, is in, um, uh, in your hands, I hope, in the report. Chapter one is a, a, a short chapter of about uh, five-ish pages on the values and principles of the UK that also tells you uh, that you can sign up to take the test and so on, so basic information about the test. Chapter two, which has, again, the odd one question, each of these two chapters, is only about one page of text. It's about what is the UK that tells you England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland are part of the UK. Chapter three is the, is the expanded chapter on British history um, involved. And you see there, in every test except the last, they have 17 tests. Don't ask me why they chose 17 as a number of tests to have. Uh, all tests had eight questions drawn from that. Um, one had nine. Uh, chapter four is about British culture uh, and sport, so questions about you know, Andy Murray, you know, is he a tennis player or, a, or is he a jockey? Um, and chapter five is a, uh, a, a kind of very wide uh, ranging chapter about British politics and about taxation and other topics. And you can see there's a clear pattern for the kinds of chapters that you need to look for if you're preparing for this test, if, this is if it is indicative of the actual test. You, can only read, you need only read some chapters. You need not read all of them if this is indicative because the 18 questions you need to get right, you can do that looking at only a couple chapters and not the rest of the book, which I think is another error. There are improvements to note in fairness about the new third edition. It is an improved look. It's glossy. It's bright. Red, white, and blue. Who can't not like that? There are fewer telephone numbers and websites. If you take the time to count them, you'll discover um, that the telephone numbers strangely went up in the second edition, the number of telephone numbers that are included for you to memorize. It's now gone down to five. Uh, websites still at a large number of 34. Um, I will be saying a little bit more about the telephone numbers you do need to know. Um, factual errors are corrected, but often by removing the facts. So the problem of how many MPs are in Westminster has been corrected by not telling you anymore. You don't need to know that number anymore. But there's another problem relating to that I will, I will tell you about. Uh, it, the answer is not so simple. There's a new sample online test, which is very indicative of the kinds of tests you, could, uh, you might face. And it is really helpful. And I think that is a really good thing that they've done. And I do support the uh, broad 
coverage of subjects, although not the full content of things that are in uh, this new broad coverage. So then what are the criticisms for the new test? What are the, the, the new things to say? Well, the first problem is that the test is impractical, in, in my, certainly in my judgment. The handbook claims it is a compendium of useful information to help applicants integrate into society and play a full role in your local community. The government wants immigrants to uh, integrate fully into uh, the community and have an active life um, with us. The government announcements on the new test launch were things like, Theresa May said, the test will enable people to participate fully. Again, uh, a restatement from the handbook. And Mark Harper said, we've stripped out mundane information uh, in, the, in the new handbook. The new handbook has removed a lot of information. That is true. It's removed information about school types. You don't need to know what a state school is or any alternative, other than if, that you could set up a free school if you wanted to. There is an, there's a website for immigrants to go to to set up our own free schools. Um, it's removed information about school types. There's no information about GCSEs or A-levels or the national curriculum. Um, no information about universities. There used to be information about that there were fees, what the fees were, uh, and the university application process. It's all been removed. They've removed how to contact emergency services. 999 is not one of the five telephone numbers included in the handbook. And before you ask, neither is 111. Uh, that also, the non-emergency emergency number. You are no longer uh, required to know how to report a crime. It's not included at all. You don't have to know how to register with the GP and use the NHS. That's all been removed. Healthcare has been removed. The new handbook does require knowledge about the age of Big Ben's clock. It's about 150 years old, in case you didn't know. I didn't want to assume no one would know, but I didn't know if there are other uh, new citizens like me in the room. And the height of the London Eye, both in feet and in meters, so it's 443 feet and 135 meters. And I think it's also the case I'm, uh, that the uh, top of Snowdonia, I think you need to know how high that is in feet and meters or something, or how wide it is in, uh, in metric and in, uh, in, uh, and in miles. Um, so as you can see, they stripped out the mundane information, but you might think they've included some others. Now, the government rejects this view that the test is impractical and unfit for purpose. And I think this, this was a response to a question, uh, a request that, uh, that uh, uh, Lord Roberts uh, put. And Lord Taylor says the majority of those applying will have been in the UK for at least five years and should therefore be aware of practical matters such as emergency services. And this thought was um, that, uh, you know, look, after five years you should know things like how to register with a GP. And actually there's some evidence that, um, that there's a disproportionate number of, uh, of new immigrants who aren't registered with a GP. So the evidence doesn't seem to support that. But that after five years you should know how to register with a GP. You should know um, how to dial 999 and so on. So the mundane practical stuff that's unnecessary to test they removed all that information. So they say, but the handbook requires that you know the following. Page numbers are given uh, in the report that London and Edinburgh are UK cities. That might be something you might not know after five years. London is the biggest UK city. British currency includes the one pound coin and the five pound note. Christmas Day, a fine festival, uh, is the 25th of December. After five years in Britain, you may not know that's the case. And that Boxing Day is the 26th. The Queen is the head of state. is something they don't assume you might know. Refuse bags should only be out when due for collection. Um, <laughs> social networking, they note only, if I recall, Facebook and Twitter. Um, so you need to know about Facebook and Twitter. Are popular ways for people to stay in touch. That's very important for you to know, and it's not mundane at all. And the United States. Uh, which I proudly left to join this great country. Uh, Britain is an independent country. You need to know that America is not a colony of Britain. Because as I say, they say, they, you know, and the government position is, right, that it's not impractical. And they've stripped out the mundane stuff. And, and this is the first things that came to mind uh, when I was live on radio being asked that. There are other problems with the test in addition to it being impractical. And this is that the test is also inconsistent. So as I've already said, the official study guide is not related at all to the official citizenship test study guide. The official citizenship test study guide of the second edition is a question and answer book. The official study guide now is a bit of the handbook and a couple of questions. It's a hybrid of the two. You need not know the number of MPs anymore, so I can sense the general uh, sigh of relief that many will have in the room. But you still must know the number of 
uh, of representatives in the Welsh Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, and the Northern Ireland Assembly. So if you think that it's not necessary for people to know how many MPs are in Westminster, what, you know, there's no rationale certainly given for why you must know about the assemblies and not Westminster. But it's better than that. Um, you need not know the phone number for the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Assembly. What am I getting at? The five telephone numbers that are noted in the handbook, not in, you know, 999 is not one of them. One is the National Domestic Violence uh, Helpline. I don't recall it. The second, which I also don't recall, is the HMRC self-assessment hotline if you want to figure out how much tax you owe. Very important number. The final three numbers are the front desks of the House of Commons, the Welsh Assembly, and the Scottish Parliament, in case you want to book a tour to visit. <laughs> <laughs> but they do not note the number for the Northern Ireland Assembly, which is, I think, an oversight. Another one, another oversight and inconsistency, is you need to know about all courts. You need to know about Crown Court, you need to know about youth courts, um, uh, and so on. But there's no mention in the book of the UK Supreme Court. So you don't need to know the top court, but you need to know everything else, which I think is an odd inconsistency defined as well. Another problem, a third problem, is gender imbalance. If you count the people, you discover in the historical chapter, of which much has been made um, by the government in promoting the handbook in fairness, you find that dates of birth and death are given for 29 men and only four women. You find neither of the Queen's birthdays are mentioned anywhere in the book. That the Queen has two birthdays is nowhere mentioned in the book. I think that's uh, interesting. If you're going to have interesting practical, well, impractical trivia about Britain, I thought that would have been one of them. In the section, uh, chapter on score, uh, sport and ch uh, culture, we have 11 men and six women. We have a bit more parody there. Musicians, seven men uh, and no women noted. Artists, nine men, no women. Uh, uh, Turner Prize winners. Damien Hirst is one of two uh, uh, Turner Prize winners noted in the handbook. Tracy Eamon gets no mention at all, who is the, uh, until I remember Damien Hirst was a winner. Eamon was the only one I had remembered. The Home Office announced celebrating um, that people, you know, the, the people that have shaped Britain. So they said that there's a section on history we've expanded. And we should be really happy about this change, you know, celebration of British culture. And the people who have shaped Britain and British history, announced by the Home Office and promoting um, the new handbook, they noted nine men um, as, the, as the people who shaped Britain. Um, and they didn't name uh, any women. There's also a number of spurious facts. One uh, fact about the handbook is that it has about 3,000 facts uh, inside including the five telephone numbers of the 34 websites I've noted. Um, the practice question book, which has 408 practice questions, has no practice questions about any of the telephone numbers and websites, nor has the second edition. The handbook includes about 278 dates, including dates for 77 people. It includes the date of the Roman invasion by uh, Emperor Claudius in, in uh, 43 AD. The official study guide notes dates for only four men. The practice questions includes zero dates of birth and death. So you have a handbook saying you need to know everything in it with almost 300 dates for you to know about people's births and deaths. And then it turns out when you look at the practice questions and the books that they give you, officially sanctioned by the government, that there are no questions or almost no uh, questions about any particular dates to be found inside. Another interesting fact is the handbook claims Winston Churchill, quote, in bold, was voted the greatest Briton of all time by the public. And it notes it happened in 2002. Churchill has the most column inches, so he gets more air time, so to speak, in the handbook than anybody else. He's the only person with multiple uh, quotations, uh, that other than, well, only person multiple, uh, with multiple quotes. And these quotes are also the only ones in bold. These are all in bold for us. Now, the 2002 a uh, 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 vote by the general public, of course. They will remember this. It was on the BBC, where the BBC, if I recall, chose 10 people to potentially be the greatest Briton, each to have a champion. Champions included Michael Portillo, I think, and Jeremy Clarkson, I think, promoted Brunel. Um, so you had a celebrity uh, 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 endorsing each of these person in an hour-long program. And then you would pay at home, if you chose to vote, you would pay every time you, you phoned for your favorite Britain of all time. And that is the vote in 2002 uh, they thought fit to include in the citizenship test for all new residents um, 
uh, to know, which was, uh, again, I think, I think an example of a spurious fact. I'll give you better and other examples. The handbook includes poetry. It's very important to include poetry, uh, it says. There are no practice questions about any poems or sonnets of the 408 questions that appear in the official practice and question book, other than who wrote to be or not to be. I think your choices are Shakespeare or Churchill. Um, you have to know which one it was. So you don't really have to know the quote, you might think. Um, there's no, there are no questions about any poems or sonnets. All poems noted in the handbook, all poems noted, have more lines noted than anything written by Shakespeare. Shakespeare, often thought to be amongst the greatest of the of poets of Britain, has um, only a few words for each of the for four different uh, uh, plays uh, noted inside the handbook. And I, if I recall correctly, Robert Burns is noted in the handbook, but I don't believe any of his poetry, any lines from Robert Burns, are included in the book. It appears the test demands applicants learn far more facts than are used in this test. So there's 3,000 facts on offer. But it turns out that no telephone numbers, no websites, no dates of birth and death, um, even perhaps the centuries when poets wrote, lie in some selected poems, none of this seems to appear in any of the practice questions and strong reason to believe that many of the facts included in the handbook actually aren't, aren't simply not going to be on the test you might actually take. But they won't be on the test that anybody is going um, to take. In that sense, spurious. So of course I should show you some questions from the uh, new uh, test. One of these is, which language was spoken by people during the Iron Age? Choices Latin, Celtic, English, Anglo-Saxon. The answer, of course, is B, Celtic. But I think that would trip up many people in the country, perhaps none in this room, um, but perhaps uh, elsewhere, and, and certainly not in the greater Durham area, but maybe elsewhere. Another problem question, is a statement below true or false? Catherine Howard was the sixth wife of Henry VIII. Who says that is true? I will ask if he... Who thinks that we've got one just for fun? Who thinks it's false? Who doesn't know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is false. Catherine Howard was a wife of Henry VIII. She wasn't the sixth. She was the fifth. Which two are buildings designed by the 17th century architect Inigo Jones? Durham Cathedral. It's only mentioned, sadly, in the official practice questions that I could find. Um, obviously not right. Neither is the last, the Tower of London. You would know that because these, bu these buildings are very old. But who, in this room, perhaps, and outside, would know who was the architect who designed the Queen's House at Greenwich or the Banqueting House in Whitehall? But these are things that all new residents ought to know and be required to know. Of course, if you get, these, you get enough of these wrong, you fail, right? And you, and you can't be a resident. You can't be I mean, it matters if you can't get these right. When walking your dog in a public place, now this, uh, this stripping out the mundane uh, uh, elements, uh, in a public place, what must you ensure? I'm waiting to see what the home office defense of this one is. That your dog wears a special dog coat. Well, perhaps if it's cold, I don't know. B, that your dog never strays more than three meters away from you. You might think, well, that sounds like you should make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, that your dog does not come into contact with other dogs. Sounds also sensible, perhaps. The correct answer, of course, is D, that your dog wears a collar showing the name and address of uh, the owner. This is very important for new residents to know. What is a responsibility that you will have as a citizen or permanent resident of the UK? Using your car as much as possible. Well, <laughs> arguable, depends on who you ask. Visiting your local pub regularly, again, arguable, depends on who you ask. <laughs> Keeping an allotment, again, arguable, uh, you know, greenest government ever, perhaps. It depends on who you ask. The, actual, the answer is, of course, D, looking after the environment is one of the responsibilities you'll have, um, which is very good. As I noted, um, there's, the, there's, uh, uh, there's an MP's problem. This relates to mistakes, I think, and omissions. So um, the MP's problem, as I call it, which to learn, not to know it for Westminster, but to know it for the assemblies and the Scottish Parliament. Um, that seems to be probably a mistake um, on the part. They should have uh, you know, thought a bit more clearly about what they were doing. Also, my friends, the return of the national insurance number problem, right? So this is my favorite question uh, in the second edition, and it was on the test I took in 2009. And the correct answer then, of course, right, was um, Job Center Plus and Social Security Office. Well, now the handbook tells you there is one place to go. The one place to go is the Department of Work and Pensions. 
But if you go to the website, looking up national, how to get a national insurance number on the government website, which I give you here, www.gov.uk, one of the websites, 34-ish websites you need to know, um, it tells you actually, you were to go to Job Center Plus, it makes no mention of the Department of Work and Pensions. I don't know if that's a mistake or a mission, they probably should have noted both, but um, uh, didn't. And of course, the Department of Work and Pensions is where the Social Security Office went. Other mistakes and omissions, well, one mistake they couldn't have foreseen. The test is already out of date. It says Thatcher is alive. Um, and she, of course, died about a fortnight after the, the handbook was published. But, um, but there are other things as well to highlight. The second edition glossary noted 413 terms over 31 pages. The third edition, the current edition, has 110 entries over seven pages. Let me read out uh, to you some of the uh, terms that uh, the, in the glossary that had been removed. And see if you can find a theme. Come up with a theme for yourself. Antenatal care is not a word included in the handbook anymore. Asylum has been removed. Bursary, disability, discrimination, emergency services, the free press. Harassment, don't want to know what harassment is. Higher education has been removed. Immigration has been removed. Legal aid has been removed in theory, and some say perhaps soon in fact. Maternity and paternity leave are two terms that have both been removed from the uh, glossary. Uh, mortgage has been removed. Racially motivated crime is a word that has been removed from the glossary. Sick pay, torture, victim, welfare benefits. <laughs> These are all things that have been removed from, uh, that were present in the second edition handbook glossary <laughs> that have been removed. Added, civil war, house, in history, for example, the House of York is, uh, is, is part of the definition, so it's very important for new immigrants to know this. Protestants, it's the only religious denomination noted in the, uh, only religion noted in the glossary. None others are noted right. in the glossary in either of the That's handbooks, which is shocking. Rural is a word that immigrants should know, and of course, sonnet <laughs> is, uh, is, is, is added. I add that in for effect. Um, a few more uh, points before I close. There's some problems with the test design. I've noted one a chapter waiting on the test. Some chapters need not be read to pass comfortably. And I gave a chart of that many of the questions don't come. They only come from a couple chapters and not from others. Much of the information included in the handbook is not tested at all from what we can gather from the official practice questions. I think that's a major problem. And the test could include information that avoids substantive engagement with UK history, culture, or governance. So the book says you must study all parts of this book, including the first chapter. And in the first chapter, it notes things like the principles and values of British life. But the first chapter also includes, and it doesn't say anywhere that this is, you know, there's some parts in the first chapter that are tested and there are some parts that are not. That first chapter also notes the uh, stationary office postal address, chapter names and subtitles, number of test questions, price of handbook. I come up with 24 different topics that could be questions that have nothing to do with life in the UK that could be tested um, because uh, it's not demarcated in the right way. And I think it's just a bad test design. In uh, comparison with the early editions, it's the early edition said, you're only tested on chapters two, three, four, and five. Uh, it was very clear about what you were tested on, what you were not, not anymore. I now turn to one a um, uh, uh, final point uh, before turning to recommendations and closing. This concerns English language proficiency. And this is something that's been um, in the news. This is a, a part of government strategy of, of tightening the requirement. So Theresa May said, it would clearly be wrong for people to be able to become British citizens with a lower level of English than that expected from permanent residents. And of course, language proficiency requirements, in all fairness, are not uncommon. It's true for the United States, it's true for Australia. Other places that have citizenship tests also have these kinds of requirements too. So it's nothing unique about Britain in that sense. So I'm not being critical that there is a requirement. And it's been statutory in the UK since at least 1915. At the moment, uh, additions one, two, and three, to pass the test, it's written in such a way that to pass it, you not only need to know the right questions, but be able to have an English level uh, of, of proficiency of what's called ESL, uh, English for Second uh, Speakers of Other Language, Entry Level 3, equivalent to this CEFR B1. I translate that as, uh, for you, Common European Framework. So there's a certain kind of standard. So if you pass a test, it's assumed that your English is, that, is that, at that level, level 3. It's true for test 1, it's true for test 2, and it's true, at the moment, for test 3. 
but it's going to be changed. From October, there's going to be a new requirement that you then pass some new test, some new test about speaking and writing uh, English. But there's several problems with it. One uh, of these is that, of course, there are, there's at least 10 exemptions to having to do uh, this requirement at all. So this new tightening, or this extra thing to do, is something that a lot of people can get out of. This includes people who have taken the English for Speakers of Other Language course. They don't have to worry about um, this requirement. People who have obtained a degree, it doesn't define what a degree is uh, in the, in the uh, recent statement of, of intent uh, by the government uh, in April. If you obtain a degree taught in English, uh, you are exempted from having to do this thing, new English language requirement. But it doesn't have to be taught in a country that speaks English. It can be anywhere, so long as the degree is taught in English you are exempt. Nationals of 16 countries um, that include the United States, that include Canada, so some places in Australia, places you'd expect, maybe some places you don't expect. Belize is included. Um, there's some countries that are not included. Um, India is not included. South Africa is not included. In fact, no country in Africa uh, or Asia is included in the list, but there's a great number of Caribbean countries and Latin American uh, that are OK, and they are exempt. Individuals age 65 or older, adult dependent relatives, persons with specified conditions. So if you are someone who is, un is judged unable to learn a new language, then you are exempt from having to learn English at this level. <laughs> Victims of domestic violence. And a wonderful qualification, if you are a Welsh speaker or a Scots Gaelic speaker and you want to take the test in Welsh and Scots Gaelic, and I haven't been able to get my hands on a copy of the test. Uh, uh, the, the test exists in these languages, but I don't believe any handbook exists in these languages. I'd be, uh, and it doesn't seem that it does. But if you take it in Welsh and Scots Gaelic or Scots Gaelic, you don't have to do this English language requirement um, either. So a statement of intent published in April 2013, setting out this tightening. Only one of the nine footnotes is noted in the main text. It's a very badly written document. Footnotes are also not numerical order. Um, most exemptions that I noted for you I didn't laugh at, because they already exist. Almost all of those uh, already uh, exist. There's no mention, of course, in the official uh, uh, study guide, the Red Book, that you can take the test in other languages. So this new uh, uh, requirement or this real focus on tightening English language is not something that's, it seems, a more recent thing. Um, but it also creates an interesting uh, new inconsistency. And let me explain what this inconsistency is that I think helps make this policy change impractical and ineffective. And the change is this. If you take the test today and pass, you pass the test and it's assumed you, you've satisfied this, this standard for English language proficiency. But if you take the same test and pass from October, it no longer counts as uh, you're, you're no longer qualified as having this kind of proficiency. So either the test today doesn't uh, guarantee you have this English language thing, so then the problem is now and what are we waiting for? Or it's perfectly fine. And what is the purpose of this other test? Of course, it's also interesting, it'll be interesting to see what the uh, fee uh, might be uh, for this new test. That has not been announced. And the final thing I'll note about this is this in this tightening of English language proficiency, making it more difficult, making the English language, uh, the requirement uh, better, that people have better English. Uh, no, it's still at the same level three. It hasn't actually changed the level. It's the same standard of English that is already required. So I have some recommendations to conclude um, for a fourth edition of the test that I think uh, uh, we probably already need. One is that the relevant text should retain the reader-friendly format. So one thing I think new, a new edition should have, it should have this kind of new reader-friendly look uh, that the current edition has. It's a much, better, uh, a much more readable format, much more reader-friendly format. Second, the test should retain its broad coverage of subjects. I think having something, having some knowledge about some basic uh, elements, you know, that there was a Magna Carta and what it was. I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. Some questions, I think, could be good from a wide area, and I think that's a good thing to include. Each edition, though, should make clear the date from which it's official, it is the official source uh, for the test, so that we avoid this problem of people not knowing which book to get for which test uh, they might uh, sit. I think a, 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 a real, uh, an easy error that could have been uh, easily overlooked. All information for each edition of the test should be published concurrently. So there's no real reason to have, uh, to have delayed by a couple of months publication of the practice questions uh, and so on. If you're going to have these, sta uh, these books, they should come out at once in part because um, uh, they include different things. And the test information of the books 
should be consistent in their content and format. So I found that the, there were inconsistencies of content and format noted in uh, uh, the report between uh, the three editions, which I was surprised to see, not least because uh, the person who authored the question book and the person who is the same person who wrote the questions in the study guide. And I was curious why his formatting was different between the two books that he wrote. All information should be revised to correct errors and omissions uh, that I've identified. And again, another probably uh, 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 readily apparent uh, error. All information should also be revised to address imbalances, gender and otherwise, um, that we find in the handbook. A bigger uh, uh, an element that has been missing in the handbooks, editions one and two, is that the official handbook should become a complete resource for information about the test. It should no longer be true that you need to get multiple books. When the government says you need only get the handbook, that's the required book for the test. It should no longer be the case you actually need to get other books to know what's actually on this test because information about how many you need to get right and so on has not been um, in the uh, handbook. The official handbook should include information that is not tested and clearly stated as such. I think a resort, as there used to be, uh, sources of information at the back with useful telephone numbers to dial and so on could be a useful thing to have and websites to uh, uh, go to. Um, but they should no longer be things that people are expected to memorize uh, uh, for the test. And balance between chapters should be addressed. So you have some chapters that have only one page of text and some that have a great many. Um, and there used to be, in editions one and two, a chapter parity. The chapters were all the same size. And from my recollection when I set the test, um, there seemed to be a, an equal, about equal number of questions from each chapter. But there should be some attempt to uh, correct this. And the final two, there should be a proper consultation with persons that have sat the life in the UK test. To my knowledge, there has not been one yet, despite one million tests being sat, uh, and it being out for about uh, uh, 10 years, I know of no proper substantive consultation um, with people who have actually set the test. There, is an, there was an email that I received from the stationary office, I think it was last week, it was on the 6th of June, asking persons who had recently purchased the handbook if they would fulfill something on SurveyMonkey um, about you know, what kind of topics they think should be in the test, and if they answer this, they can get 10% off. I also saw you could answer the questionnaire multiple times and it didn't correct you. There should be more evidence found to inform the future of the test. We should, what should we expect immigrants to know? How can we best guarantee this based on evidence? These are questions we should ask that are not answered. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this report launch. I hope you found some of the uh, questions information not just informative but also entertaining and thank you for your attention. First of all, Tom, thank you for presenting us with an excellent ref impact case study. <laughs> uh, no, doubt you, no doubt you are a rolling impact case study. If you do this for each test, you could just keep going into those graphs. This is just <laughs> ideal, <laughs> ideal research material under the current <laughs> regime. Um, let me start with a, an obvious question. You know, mm -hmm. One way to correct it all and to reformat it and to make it simple is to have it all online. Mm -hmm. So you just keep correcting your facts. Mm -hmm. You know, someone points it out, you point it out, someone goes online and changes it immediately. Mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher's dead, change the dates. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it, why don't they use more online resource now? That's a very good question. The online, there's a website for the Life in the UK test. It is a little bit better uh, than it was a few years ago. One thing that, it, it, that is better about it is that it does have an official sample test you can take that does look and feel a lot like the test and so on. So that's, that's a useful thing in, in forward. But why uh, I don't do, do this? Well, very good question. In other countries that have a citizenship test, and I've kept my sample small uh, so uh, to avoid getting into every country that has, uh, has a test, but Australia and the United States has two. One, a member of the Commonwealth. One, well, former colony, now shoulder to shoulder friend. Both of these countries, Australia and the United States, have a citizenship test. Both have a, have a booklet that you need to know. But these booklets are free, <coughs> freely available. They are online. The United States um, uh, uh, book, uh, you can get the book. You can get the questions. You can get uh, it in audio. Uh, you can get it video. Uh, you can see all the English. You can get uh, um, like index card-like slides you can print off to help you with your English uh, language 
uh, for efficiency and so on. All this stuff is available. Multimedia, wonderful website, easy to use for free. Australia, a bit less multimedia, a bit less friendly, but still all right. And, and the Australian handbook, it's about 30 odd pages. Um, this handbook, one of, this is the official book you need to know. Then there's the two I think you really ought to look at. This is 180 pages um, compared to, say, 30 in Australia. And the difference isn't that Australia has a shorter history. Um, so I think there ought to be a more uh, user-friendly website and one that has links to the information that people uh, can go to and use. It seems sort of obvious now, since you can update mistakes and, uh, and update facts. Absolutely. It's a curiosity. All right. Um, questions? A uh, slightly provocative comment. Um, you say that the test... Thing there, uh, so I'm Gillian Folger from... I'm a geophysicist. Uh -huh. um, you say that the test uh, has broad coverage, but I get the impression from you that it's sort of really focused on um, history, sport, and um, politics. But, I mean, is there anything about the biology of the country or the meteorology or the geography or great inventions? Or uh, yes, there are uh, information about inventions. So I stuck with some examples. i sure my talk was... Uh, just at the limit, uh, what could be tolerated um, by my kind host. At this uh, stage oh, in the academic year. At this stage in the academic year, there's, there's a bit, people are a bit relaxed. But you need to know things like Richard uh, Arkwright was uh, uh, remembered for his efficient and, and profitable way that he ran his factory. So there's a little bit about this. Of course, you also need to know he was originally trained as a barber and originally dyed hair and made wigs. But they have information about scientific um, discoveries here, and I was going to briefly note them. So some great British inventions of the 20th century, you need to know about television radar, the Turing machine, you need to know about insulin, structure of the DNA mo molecule was, uh, was discovered by, uh, in 1953 um, through work at British universities uh, uh, and, and Francis Crick. You need to know about the jet engine, the hovercraft, the Concorde, the Harrier ju ju uh, uh, jump jet, the uh, Cash dispensing ATM machine. IVF therapy is developed uh, in this country, um, uh, but no, uh, and Dolly the sheep is noted as well. The, the MRI scanner was developed here, um, and by who? Uh, Sir Peter Mansfield, for those who are rolling off the tip of your tongues. So there is some information, little information, about the inventors uh, and scientists. Note that all the uh, things I mentioned, they are all men as well, so there's no female scientists. Uh, noted uh, in the book. Sorry, Gillian. Yeah. Not yet, but as I say, there ought to be a fourth edition, in including right. others, perhaps. Further reflections? Please. Uh, well, uh, Lyra Hernandez, your colleague in the law school. Um, I have a comment and a question. My comment is that, well, this thing, I mean, thank you for the meticulous deconstruction of the test, and basically mm -hmm. exposing many, many holes in it. But I think it raises a bigger question about um, what the purpose of the test is for and what the purpose of forcing an immigrant to read that 180 pages and do the practice questions is. Is it to equip them to be able to participate fully in life as a British citizen? Is it to reassure those existing members of the community that, that there's a certain stamp of approval, that there are certain basic facts that we are entitled to expect from them? Mm -hmm. Or is it for them to demonstrate to us that they are sufficiently versed and proficient in certain things that we expect from them that we don't expect from us. And at, mm -hmm. at each stage, and I say this as an immigrant, yes. you know, who's not sat the test, mm -hmm. and who <laughs> probably will have to. But anyway, <laughs> I can um, help. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm sure you can. Yeah, I'm very good but at I think, I, think, I think those are competing purposes, and they're not necessarily reconcilable. At some point, mm -hmm. a balance is struck one way. And mm -hmm. it strikes me that the way you've presented the information here, the balance seems to be struck less and less in preparing the immigrant for life in the UK and more and more at satisfying existing citizens that there is some ephemeral standard that all immigrants must conform to. And then I guess there comes my question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we ought to have a test? Uh, Do you think there's room to say, I mean, if, if we cannot identify what the test is for, if we don't have a why, mm -hmm. should we have a test in this form? Mm. Or should we have something else? And should we be reflecting as a society as to what is the purpose of a citizenship test, of a requirement to become mm. a fully participating member in a political community? I know that's a wider question. But I was just wondering if, I, if you had views on that, because most of this has been reformist. Yes. So just Absolutely right. You know. No, Glider, as usual, you uh, ask beautiful questions, and, uh, and that's yet another example. Um, there's an awful lot in what you say. So the origins, of course, the origins of the test all 
happened, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the beginnings happened around the time I started coming to this uh, country when I came to 2001. So as I note, um, you know, it was around then that David Blunkett uh, started setting up, well, there was the Denim Report in 2001, and then shortly afterwards, we had the Life in the UK Advisory Committee uh, group, and uh, things took a life on from there. And what I think spurred this on, and I'm happy to be corrected by people present, but this conversation that began about Britishness, about what is Britishness, and one of the findings of the group that I, that I, uh, from my uh, re recollection from reading it was, uh, hmm, that's difficult. It's hard to kind of pin down exactly what is that one narrative or that one uh, thing we ought to know. And also this critical angle about whether or not that is what our, where our focus should be. So instead, the uh, 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 Bernard Crick's group uh, recommended instead that we not so much focus on Britishness in terms of whatever that was, but instead focus on certain values and principles that people might share um, of fairness and equality and so on. Of course, one of the most uh, um, uh, derided uh, examples in the uh, first edition was it notes, if you accidentally spill a pint in a pub, in a pub what should you do? And it notes that it is prudent. Uh, as well as wise, prudent, as it does say this, um, to purchase someone a drink if you've spilled it uh, uh, in a pub. As part of the thing, they're trying to think through what it meant to have these values and principles of being British and the kinds of things you should know in your everyday life. Now, of course, something like that is a bit silly, uh, right? So, you know, that you knocking over pints and pubs and so on, should this be the kind of thing that should be on a serious citizenship test? Probably not. And of course, it was removed in the second edition and it hasn't come. Um, back. I think, uh, so its origins are clearly in this focus on everyday life and uh, immigrants being able to participate fully and make a positive contribution to British society. And to do that, they need to know what the NHS is. They need to know about how their children and now perhaps themselves can have educational achievements and qualifications and so on. Um, and it has shifted uh, towards this perhaps not so much seeing what, you know, it's not so much about what we want immigrants to know, but what we want to reassure ourselves about what immigrants might know, as uh, you uh, put it much better. However, one further reason for the support is, so the public wants greater immigration control. So one way we do this is we make bigger books. We make the test harder. We throw in lots of dates. We put in sonnets and we put in poems, none of which might actually be on the test. We put all this stuff uh, in this handbook to show that we are tough on immigration. And who knows uh, any of this stuff uh, is the case. I imagine, and perhaps not for all of you, but for many of you, unless you've sat the test or had so, you probably haven't had much familiarity with these handbooks. I brought them because it might be the first time many of you might have actually seen uh, any of the editions of what this uh, book looks like. And I think it's, there's this problem then. If, so if the purpose is to reassure a British public that the new permanent residents are the kinds of folks we want to have around here, well, they could do a little bit more in, in communicating with the public and consulting widely about what the public really wants to find uh, in this test, of which there hasn't been. There was very wide consultation before the first test with a lot of groups, um, including Citizens Advice Bureau and others. There's a lot of different bodies that were involved in the running. But that is, to my knowledge, has ceased beyond a very small uh, cater. Since. Senior tutor here, member of the German department. Um, if we take what you say, that this test is designed to help people to integrate better, mm -hmm. doesn't it come at the completely wrong time for the completely wrong people? Ah. Shouldn't there be something set at the time of when people arrive to help mm. them? Because if, like you say, there's a minimum of five years or something like that, you're supposed to have lived here. Mm. By that time, a lot of these things are either absorbed, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Anyway. But, I mean, as a linguist, I would say that, wouldn't I? But doesn't a lot of decent language teaching include a lot of good culture teaching uh -huh. and should therefore set in at a much earlier stage as a compulsory, not for those who take this as a voluntary thing, because a lot of people just stay, but not with the aim to become a British citizen. Yes. I mean, it'd be difficult in some sense to see what would happen if... if so this is a test you have to... You, uh, um, uh, you have to take to have permanent residency or citizenship to get to that stage. And that, you know, uh, for people, largely it, it affects people who are not from the EU. So uh, when I had my citizenship ceremony in Gateshead uh, in 2011, there was someone 
uh, there from the Czech Republic. There was someone else who paid the fees and took the test and went through the steps, even though he might have been able to stay anyway um, uh, uh, to be, you know, he also wanted to uh, be a British citizen um, as, as well. I think it would be difficult to see how the test might work as a kind of um, people who haven't been to the UK kind of entering and having to take this test in order to take up employment. But you have this very, very good point about, well, uh, echoed by the government to some degree, that you know, there is a lot of information we kind of expect people uh, to know anyway. And is the test about what we should expect people to know already? And if so, then why have the test? You might expect them already to have it. Or if it's stuff that we kind of require all people to know, then you get this other question about, well, what if the people who are natives, you know, the, the already current British citizens, you know, if it's the case that many of them don't know this, then why is it then required, on the other hand, for people? I can say for permanent residency and for citizenship, there are various things. It's not just kind of living here for five years um, that does it. You, um, you cannot have criminal, uh, unspent criminal convictions. Uh, for citizenship, of course, you can't have any convictions. Any conviction can be, uh, you could be uh, um, uh, uh, um, rejected. You'd be rejected if you're on the sex offender register, uh, perhaps obviously. Um, if you have, um, if you've ever been bankrupt, you can be denied uh, citizenship, even if you pass the test and you've lived here happily. Um, if you have a point in your license, a point on any points on license on your driving license, even an L license, must be declared. Uh, when you uh, submit your citizenship application, if you have one. That can be grounds for the Home Office uh, to reject your application. The application is now just, it's about 860 odd, uh, I'm happy to be corrected on this, I think it's about 860 pounds. Um, 113 pounds of which goes towards your citizenship ceremony, which you don't get back if they reject your, uh, 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 if, you, if you're rejecting your application. And that got me, of course, the Medal of Gates head, uh, which says Gates head on the front, very proudly, and on the back, um, it says, um, you know, British citizenship ceremony or something like this. Could I just come back to Glider a minute? Please. Were you, are you happy with the response you got to the question, to, should there really be a citizenship test? Be honest, Glider. You usually are. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I'd be interested in hearing your views as to uh, whether the test achieves positive, I mean, whether the test, your question is, is the test unfit for purpose? Yes. I'd like to know, I mean, we know yes. that you, you, you say it's unfit it for is purpose, purpose. Yeah. but you haven't really told me what you think that purpose is and whether, whether it's even attainable wh or whether it's inherent in the structure of a test like this, that it's just impossible. Like when you start saying something more radical too, that there, mm. that there may not be a good grounds for having a test at all. I was. That was going to be the yes. follow-up to this. Is if, if you can't identify why you, why you have tests, should you have a test at all? Yes. Mm. And that's a position you take, just to be clear. I come from a country of immigration. I come from a country where we do have a test. It's mm. been around for a long time. Both my parents took it. Mm. And the view in Canadian society is if you take this test, you are fully entitled to exercise the privileges of citizenship because you've proven that you can pass a, a, a hurdle. The test is not designed to prepare you for life there. The mm. test is to establish that you've assimilated sufficiently into the values of our society. However, Canadian society makes a very strong claim to multiculturalism. Mm. The test is not excuse me to the Brits in the room, is not as jingoistic. It does not demand the sort of detailed specialized knowledge of British culture, British history, British values, as expressed in years, sonnets, and, and facts. Mm. But our, our test, the inner logic of our test is based in a different society. <laughs> <laughs> the inner logic of our test is based in a different society. And there is a clear purpose. Mm. And I just have trouble seeing what the clear purpose of this test is. Mm. It seems to try to be different things just, to different people. Just and hold that, Tom. Because I, I think we'll just take a few more questions and Please. let you wrap it all up okay. as, we, as the clock gets towards 10. Mm -hmm. Not so much a question, a comment. I'm here in defense of the, uh, of the citizenship test. Ah, because you might know this program, they have it in the United States, they might have it in Britain as well, I don't know. We don't have it in Holland. It's called, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Ah, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> smarter than a two-year-old. Uh -huh. The problem is, most people are not smarter than a fifth grader, though they did have that primary education. Mm -hmm. It's not so much about knowing these facts. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more, I don't know what the, the British word would be, but no, build them. Having the like right an education, a cultural education. Cultural education. Yeah. So we've all been through that primary education in England, Holland, Germany, wherever. Mm -hmm. and we expect other people to have to to walk shoulder to sh shoulder by shoulder, shoulder to shoulder. We need to walk <laughs> as equals, and as equals, we've all been through this test. Mm. And the test is just 
it's all symbol politics. Right. And the symbol is building, it's for building. Mm -hmm. And that, if it's 43 I'm AD holding. or 48 <laughs> AD, we don't care because I can't even remember when, you know, the Spanish invaded Holland, but I can't remember. Okay, all right, hold that. We've got two agitated men over there for the sake of gender, <laughs> but for the sake of gender balance, I'm going to ask Ava to, uh -huh. to ask her question, then we'll come back to them. Uh -huh. Good. Uh -huh. Well, first of all, I sort of agree with Claudia anyway, so I'd like yes. to really discuss that, because I, I, it's, it's ridiculous to me anyway. Uh -huh. But if one were to be a reformist, I would probably have wanted to go even a, fur a step further, mm. because I think what this assumes is that people come here as aliens with no previous culture, right? Mm. And the only I mean, to my mind, citizenship only makes sense in the context of another kind of citizenship one has. So mm -hmm. you don't really, you're not plonked in, in you know, um, from nothing. Yeah. You come in in media as race. So I just wonder whether there's room, given that there's so many unemployed people these days, you know, in this country, mm -hmm. having different cultural backgrounds, whether it makes sense to sort of split up citizenship tests and actually mm -hmm. have foils from different cultures. So in other words, what does the parliamentary system most resemble, you know, mm -hmm. Could it be some other part of it, or is a sonnet, you know, something like poetry from another region? But ah. just make it a little bit more comparative. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a marker, mm. um, because as someone who's been here for 18 years, you need these markers, otherwise mm. you're lost, and you kind of think everyone is insane, but they're not. <laughs> and they're not because and you can you only know that they're not insane if you have your own, you know, markers. And I yeah. think it probably either needs complete scrap. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm probably more on the side of scrapping, uh -huh. <laughs> not normatively speaking. Uh -huh. But if you weren't to scrap but to reform, it mm -hmm. has to be done in a much more detailed, I think, way to make sense mm -hmm. of the word citizenship. Otherwise, it's just mm -hmm. something. We've got, we've got two agitated people over here. If we can speak <laughs> briefly, and then we'll come. I want to just sweep those who haven't had a chance to speak. So go on, Patrick. I was wondering how sensitive this test is to equality and diversity and to learning disabilities in that sense. Because you can maybe be not smarter than a fifth grader, mm. but if you have certain difficulties with the test in language proficiency as well, I was wondering how sensitive it is to the test. You don't have to take it. Yeah. You can get you an exemption. It. It's an exemption. So if I am dyslexic, I don't have to take the test. I don't know about dyslexic, but there, um, for uh, for a fact. But if uh, but if you if you if, but there are certain learning disabilities that if you have those, you can be exempted from taking the test. Yeah, because I feel altogether. We're in, in a room quite with ugly smart people. But like you said, if not everyone is smarter than a fifth grader, is it that, you know, it, are these people that are not passing the test? Mm. Or is it just cramming a lot of facts and if you're not good at that, you will fail the test? Mm. I, I just had a very small intervention in relation to the yes, question. Is, is that right? Very, very, very small. Just are we asking for them to have the building or the, the culture general or whatever you want to call it? Are we asking immigrants to have it for their own good? Or are we asking it for ourselves? Okay. And I think that that's the question. That's we'll let Tom reflect on that question in a minute. That's clear. Gillian? Um, I, I just want to say that I, I, I feel very <coughs> uncomfortable about setting a test for people that we couldn't pass ourselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I feel very reply. uncomfortable about that. That's a mm. key threshold issue, yes. Yeah. Please. Um, just a brief comment. Um, if, if the test is designed to reflect whether you've assimilated into the culture, mm -hmm. I actually think the question of what should you do if you spill someone's pint in a pub ah. is a much better question ah, yeah. than what is the height of the London Eye. Yeah. Yeah. Because There's someone who's assimilated absolutely. into the culture will know that's what's expected of you, whereas mm -hmm. who knows the height of the London Eye, really? I mean... Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anybody want to make a final... I think, no, I, I think, give, I was going to, but I mean, I, I just I have one reflection. Please. C citizenship is, is about setting down a common set of rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Citizenship across countries, you know, defines distinctive patterns of rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think if people are applying to join a country, mm -hmm. as it were, it is not unreasonable they know what that pattern is. Now that pattern, it seems to me, does not require a deep test of facts. Mm -hmm. It does require a sense of an intuition for what are the markers that mark off this is a kind mm. of community which you want to join. Mm. That's a versions of, an, uh, of, a, of, a, of, of consent to join, although it's, of course it's much more complicated than that, mm -hmm. from other markers mm. about it. So it seems to me the whole thing could be, of course, much more simple. 
But then it wouldn't please the ideologues who want this to be more than that. Hmm. But if it's about the universal requirements of citizenship, then that is something that is distinctive. Mm. We do have different patterns in different nation states. And if you want to join, it seems to me completely reasonable. Mm. You know what those markers are, because those are what essentially defines the political community. Mm. I agree now, with all of let's, that. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's give you five minutes to finish. I'll, take, I'll, I could, I'll try to do a little bit less. I mean, I'll say, Kind of a, a, a general reflection on various. I mean, there's some interesting ideas about how the test could be reset in, in a kind of comparative way. I um, I think that'd be interesting. I think it, it could be complicated, but you know, many of the best things in life are, are complicated. Um, so um, uh, maybe there should be more thinking about that. I mean, I suppose with the support, I had one kind of one or two kind of central purposes with it. One was to highlight the problem that seemed to be something, this kind of dirty little secret that all uh, immigrants knew. And that was that this test had serious problems. And no one else seemed to be aware. So one was to kind of really expose this in uh, stark relief um, as loudly and as best uh, that I can. The second was um, trying to be realistic about what effect my highlighting that there are these problems might be. So I have gone reformist in the sense of trying to come up with some ideas about what might be what could realistically be expected in a new edition? What can I expect to be some uh, future um, uh, test? Questions about should there be kind of to the root and branch? Should there be any test? Um, and kind of deeper, you know, not just is it unfit for the purposes at which it sets itself out, which are that it is a practical guide about practical life in the UK, and I'm saying it's not fit for the purpose it sets out uh, for itself. But should it have some other purpose? Um, or uh, I think that there most definitely needs to be a new conversation, not unlike what happened in uh, the run-up to the first edition of the test, where there is a conversation about what we expect from citizenship again, um, and thinking about what we want this test to do, what we expect from immigrants. There was a, I think on the whole, fairly healthy-ish uh, uh, conversation that happened uh, under Sir Bernard Crick once upon a time, uh, looking into how this might work. Um, and so on. But then since then, that is stopped with the publication of the first test. And now the test has become something that we criticize and that it's wrong, we don't do anything about. And I wanted to say something about, in uh, uh, stark detail, what is wrong, but then also how we can get all this stuff uh, right. Am I then against, you know, would I support no test or a different kind of test? Well, I don't know. I think there should be a new conversation about it. Of course, in the United States, there is a test. Um, that has 10 questions. You're given the, all the questions in advance. You want to look at them. And it's things like, you know, who's the first president? If you don't know who George Washington is, the suggestion is you're not one of us. If you don't know the Mississippi or Missouri are one of the two biggest rivers, um, then you're not American, so to speak. And there's some kind of very simple, uh, kind of, you need to name one of a list of uh, Native American tribes, you know, have some recollection of what one might be, uh, and so on. I don't know if that model is best. But I do think what is, I think we can learn from other countries what they've done with the test, something I don't think has been done in any serious way. Some of the things we can learn from other countries are things like having a multimedia website, a much better resource for new residents and immigrants to get information about the test and how they can prepare themselves. I think also it would be very good if it was free, like it is in other countries uh, with video and other kinds of things, but yeah. I'm not holding out. Uh, that's not one of my recommendations that should be free because I don't, I, I'm, I'm more pessimistic about, uh, about that. But I do think there's this, these questions about what we should expect immigrants to know and what we, can best, what we can do to best guarantee this and some evidence for it, rather than pandering for a crowd that isn't listening or watching. I mean, it was a common refrain, a final thought. It's a final refrain as I uh, uh, was uh, 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 seeking permanent residency and then waiting uh, to become a British citizen. Uh, it was a constant refrain about, oh, well, you know, you're all right because you're an American. We know Americans go back. No American would stay here. I forget how many times I heard that. Of course, untrue. Um, I've stayed. Um, but the other thing um, was that, um, you know, there's this problem with immigrants and all the benefits and other kinds of things that I was somehow entitled to. And of course, as a non-EU person, the people 
who are sitting this and they're, you know, in a million. Uh, the overwhelming majority, I would assume, would be non-EU uh, citizens um, are unable to claim any benefit. They're not able to have public housing. They're not able to get any help if you're unemployed. I was only able to be here on my first visa if I was employed by a particular uh, a employer. And then afterwards, when I had permanent residency, I passed my test. I'm a permanent resident. I still had no claim for anything. If anything went bad for me and I couldn't talk my parents into helping me and I'm the oldest of five, they're sick of looking after me. I, they won't give me anything. Um, I, you know, I'm on my own. And these, these thoughts about what all immigrants are entitled to, and not that I, you know, and I, and I don't like the, the kind of critique anyway. Um, the, the problem, uh, I think there's a problem about immigration debate anyway, perhaps obviously. Um, but there's, there's these kind of deep misunderstandings about who immigrants are, what this test is about, and what purpose it might serve um, that we need to address. So I think there's some more fundamental things, too, in the mix for certain. Purpose of the report, of course, that would be more than a report. It'd be another book. Um, and I'm going to uh, reflect further on that one. But thank you very much, everyone, for your comments and your questions. Thank you.